Hey guys, welcome back to our channel. It's your girl Fanny Lungu back with another reaction video. Today I'm going to be reacting to amazing last story of Prophet Muhammad part 2 of 2. Last time I was so excited to react to the first one and I'm very excited to actually be reacting to the second part of this and see how this story concludes or how it ends, whatever the case is. I didn't comment much in the last video because it was just the story was just amazing guys it was i uh, i don't know and i like how they showed i like how they portrayed these people in this case the man was humble the woman was humble as well but at least it's one of those situations where women are actually being showed in a more human form they always portray women as perfect this and that and i liked in this case that she had a past and she still thought of actually moving on such type of things without wasting any time let's get into the video and there the matter then went to stage two her uncle Amr ibn Asad became her wadi and Abu Talib came with the Prophet وسلم, and Abu Talib performed the khutbah he performed the sermon so this clearly shows that the Prophet وسلم, is not a, a lustful man that if he wanted to, he could have married a younger lady without children who had never been married a virgin. If he wanted to, he could have done that. But he married somebody of nobility, somebody who was twice divorced with children and remained faithful to her until Khadija passed away. He never took another wife until Khadija passed away. And so he wasn't marrying for lustful reasons because he's marrying when he's past 54 years old, he begins to marry uh, the nine wives. For until he's 54, from 25 up until the age of 54 or so, if not 55, because Aisha uh, 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 probably was when he was 55 years old or so. So uh, the Prophet is remaining basically loyal to Khadija for all of these years. And this clearly shows that he was not a man who was lustful, that he could control his desires, that this was not what he had in mind by marrying somebody like uh, Khadija. Now the question arises, how old was Khadija at the time of her marriage? The common opinion that everybody is aware of is that she was 40 years old when she was married and she died when she was 65 because everybody agrees that they were married for 25 years and everybody agrees that the Prophet was 25 years old. Well, not everybody, one or two say he was 24 and 23, but around this age, 25 years old when he got married. However, and this is the common well-known age that people have. However, there are more authentic reports that her age was not 40. And so we have people like Al-Bayhaqi and Ibn Kathir, the famous scholar Ibn Kathir who wrote the tafsir of Ibn Kathir and, uh, uh, and others a report that she died when she was around 50 years old. So if she died when she was around 50, this changes everything. In her 50s, they say. She was in her 50s. This changes everything. Another early authority, and his name is Hisham al-Kalbi, uh, says that Khadija married when she was 28 years old. And we have from Al-Hakim, who wrote a book called Al-Mustadrak, which was one of the books of Hadith, he reports from the famous Ibn Ishaq, who is the earliest author of the seerah, Ibn Ishaq, the famous seerah Ibn Ishaq, that Ibn Ishaq says that she was 28 years old. Now, this appears to be more valid for two reasons. Number one, because the people who are reporting 28 are more in quantity and in quality, i.e. they are more knowledgeable. Ibn Ishaq is the authority of Sirah. Nobody is more authoritative than him. And Ibn Ishaq is reporting that she was 28. Uh, additionally, Hisham al-Kalbi. Additionally, Al-Bayhaqi says she died when she was in her 50s. That means she was 28 when she, or around that age when she got married. But then the second point is even more clear. The Prophet and Khadija had at least six children, maybe more. And a woman in her 40s, it is very difficult to imagine her having six children. Whereas a woman who is 28, it is much more logical and rational and in fact perfect. Six children at the age of 28 in those days is something that is very reasonable. A child every year and a half, every two years, very reasonable. Uh, so for 12 years she's having children, so she's having children she's, till she's around 40. And this makes a lot more sense than to say that she was 40 when she got uh, married. 
and uh, academically speaking, it does seem to be the more correct opinion that uh, she was 28 years old. One time, the Prophet is sitting at home. Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha gets up and goes to, you know, the fire, the stove that's burning like right outside the door of the house. So she steps outside to go, you know, kind of check on whatever's cooking in the fire, the stove. Jibreel alayhi salam comes to the Prophet And he says to the Prophet here comes Khadija. She's got a bowl of food for you in her hands. A warm, hot, steaming bowl of food, fresh food for you. When she comes to you with this food and places in front of you, I want you to grab a hold of her and tell her that God sends His salam. Allah says salam to Khadija. And Allah gives her the good news. Congratulates her. Allah is congratulating her that she will have a palace in paradise. There will be no noise, no difficulty, no adversity there ever. And that palace is ready. God has prepared it Himself for Khadija. And He wants to let her know that He's got it ready for her. And He sends her salam to let her know that He waits for her. When the Prophet ﷺ tells Khadija anha, she breaks down into tears. And so Khadija responded that, Inna Allah huwa salam. She didn't say wa alaykas salam ya Allah because you don't say wa alaykas salam ya Allah. Allah is a salam and this really shows her intelligence. It really shows her understanding of theology of Islam. Wa ala Jibreel as salam and may salam be upon Jibreel wa alayka ya Rasulullah as salam and may salam be upon you ya Rasulullah. This was Khadija's uh, response. Uh, she was the only one whom Jibreel would come in the household of Khadija. He would not enter any other household, any other wife's house. Any other wife's house, he would not enter later on. Aisha, Umm Salama, no one. He only entered the house of Khadija. The Prophet wasallam needed support and comfort for his future mission. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for him a woman who would give him that support and comfort. And as we uh, all know and we say, and it is so true, that behind every successful man there is a there is a good woman. This is the fact of life and this is something that every single person acknowledges. Men can pretend to be macho and strong and, and whatnot, but the fact of the matter is they need a loving, uh, supporting woman in their lives. This is the reality that Allah created men like this, that in public they can put on this, this persona, but in private they need the comfort and the support of a loving wife. Otherwise, it's very difficult, if not impossible. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah chose for him Khadija to be that loving and that comforting wife. He has just gotten married. He was spending time with his wife. They were having kids. They were raising a family. They were raising beautiful children. I mean, we talk about Zainab and Umm Kulthum and Ruqayya and Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anhunna. Right, we talk about these noble, illustrious women. They didn't just materialize out of thin air. But they were the product of prophetic tarbiyah. The, pro the prophetic upbringing. So he spent time with his kids. He sat with his kids. He played with his kids. He fed his kids, tucked them in at night. Talked to them, spoke to them, played with them. That's what the Prophet ﷺ invested a decade of his life into. So now the next 15 years of his marriage, from the time of when he was 25 years old, the 15 years of their marriage, life together, Muhammad and Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anhumah, alright, they had six children during this time. Six children. The first of their children was a boy by the name of Al-Qasim. And that's where the kunniya, the nickname of the Prophet ﷺ, Abu Al-Qasim comes from. Again, very tragically, Qasim reached the age of a year and basically passed away before his second birthday. It was a very tragic loss for this, this couple. 
Secondly, they had a daughter by the name of Zainab, who lived, who grew up and lived a full life. She got married, she had children, etc. Their third child, second daughter, was by the name of Umm Kulthum, who would later on be married to the famous Khalifa, companion of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, by the name of Uthman ibn Affan, radiallahu anhu, may Allah be pleased with him. The third daughter and fourth child that they had was a girl by the name of Ruqayya, the name of Ruqayya. And she would also grow up. Um, and after Umm Kulthum would pass away very tragically, very young, she would fall very ill and she would die. Then Ruqayya would become, would be married later on to Uthman ibn Affan. And then their fifth child, their fourth daughter, was a girl by the name of Fatima. Fatima. Who again was the only child of the Prophet ﷺ who outlived it. And she passed away six months after he passed away. And she would have children, she would have two sons by the name of Hassan and Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. And they would be just the heart and soul of the Prophet ﷺ. He loved them so much. And then finally his sixth child, which was his second son, was, the name of, was by the name of Abdullah. He was born after Revelation came, and so that's why he was known as a tahir That he was born in the era of Revelation. And he also passed away very, very young. Some narrations even mention that he, he passed away while still an infant. And again, it was very tragic for them. The Prophet ﷺ did have a seventh child, a third son, who would also pass away while he was still young by the name of Ibrahim. But that would be later on from another one of his spouses, from another one of his wives, Maria Qutiyah. So this, this, these were the six children that him and Khadija had together. And they had two sons, four daughters. Both sons passed away very, very young as babies. And the four daughters would outlive their mother, Khadija. Now the Prophet ﷺ reaches the age of about, you can say 38 or 39. And they've built a beautiful home and a, they, they, they have a beautiful family. This couple has grown together deeply in love. There are some narrations that talk about the, the Khadija that she never, they never argued, they never fought. They never had any difficulty or adversity with one another. It was peace and happiness, love and affection, kindness and mercy and forgiveness. And when he reached the age of 38, 39, the Prophet ﷺ had a very interesting experience. He started to see dreams at night. He started to have dreams at night. And what would happen is the next day, the dream would come true. Like whatever he saw in his dream would occur in the next day. And then, so the first time you're like, okay, then the second time, third time, fourth time, and it became a daily event. So much so that he just expected it. A ru'ya as And that was to get him to just kind of trust his heart. To be comfortable with having knowledge, with being given knowledge that was not available, was not possible to be attained anywhere else. And once that started to happen, then he really started to reflect and deep think, uh, very, you know, think very deeply. And that's when the Prophet ﷺ decided, I need to kind of get some time away. I need some time to reflect. I need some time to just invest into just some deep thought, deep reflection. Get away from the noise. And that's when he tells his wife, and he's been telling her, I have these dreams, and whatever I see comes true the next day. And she tells him, don't worry, just trust your heart. Everything has a purpose and a reason. Then he comes to her and tells her, I need some time to reflect, to think. I need to get away for a little bit. And she says, absolutely. How long do you need to go for? At least a couple of days. I'm going to go find a nice spot in the mountains, not too far away. But I need a secluded, nice spot where I can go and I can reflect. She packs him together some food, some supplies, some clothes, and sends him off very lovingly. And the Prophet ﷺ goes outside of Mecca, finds a mountain by the name of Nur, Jabal Nur. 
And there he finds a small cave by the name of Hira, Ghar Hira. And he actually chose that spot because when he sat at the mouth of the cave, he could see the Kaaba from there. And he sits down and he begins to meditate and reflect and pray and think over it. And he would be gone for a few days at a time and he would come back down and go back home, spend a few weeks at home, a month or so at home, then pack up some stuff and then go again. And this way he would kind of come and go, take a few days here and there. One time it mentions that he was gone and Khadija helped him pack the stuff that he was taking. So she knew exactly how much food he had. And when they go, when he goes, she realizes that he's been gone longer than what he had food for. So she packs some food and some supplies together and she actually goes outside of Mecca and climbs up the mountain and the Prophet is sitting at the opening of the gate and he sees her and says, what are you doing here? And she says, I got worried about you. I want to make sure that you were okay. I brought some food for you. So this is what their relationship was like, one of understanding and facilitating and providing and accommodating one another. So we know of that blessed day when the Prophet ﷺ receives divine revelation. And so now the Prophet ﷺ comes back down from the cave. And he comes home. And he's shaking and trembling, overwhelmed by this profound experience. Unlike anything any human being has ever experienced. There, has been, there have been many a messenger and prophet before him, but he just receives the Qur'an. Most powerful experience any human being has ever had. So he's overwhelmed, shaking and trembling. And he comes home and he tells his beloved wife, Khadija radiallahu anha, Dathiruni, Dathiruni, Zambiluni, Zambiluni, cover me, wrap me up in a blanket, in a shawl. Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha wraps him up and covers him up. And then she asks him, that tell me what happened. Tell me what happened. And the Prophet ﷺ tells her the entire experience. That this angel, he came to me. And he said the following words to me. And he recites the Qur'an to her. And tells him of the divine responsibility that has been placed on his shoulder. Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, now we see what marriage, what it really culminates in. She sits down next to him. She takes his hand. She looks him in the eye. And this is what she says to him. This is how she defines 15 years of marriage. Six children later. The death of two of those children. Everything they've been through. Listen to what she has to say. This is her summary of her husband. This is how she explains and defines him. She says, Kalla wallahi. She says, absolutely nothing to worry about. I swear to God. La yukhzika Allahu abada. God will never ruin you. He will never abandon you. Why am I so confident in saying this? What do I know about you? After 15 years of sharing morning and evening, day and night, after sharing a life with you, what can I say about you? Innaka la tasilu rahim. Innaka la tasilu rahim. You're a good family man. You take care of your family. You love your family. Wa tuqri wa taqri al-dayf. You honor your guest. You look for people who are overlooked and neglected and downtrodden by society. And you go and you grab them by the hand and lift them back up. You go and give to those people who can't, you take care of those people who can't take care of themselves. You look for those people. And you are always the first one waiting there whenever there's a good cause. There's no way that God would ever abandon you, that God would ever forsake you. I refuse to believe it. And then the Prophet 
tells her that's fine. But who will believe this message? And she says, I believe this message. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu annaka rasul. And then she even helps him. However she can, whatever she knows. She takes him to her cousin Waraqa bin Nawfal. She said he knows. He talks about this type of stuff. He talks about prophets and revelation and angels and God and divine inspiration. He talks about this stuff. I'll do what I can. And she takes the Prophet ﷺ to her cousin and introduces them. And the Prophet ﷺ talks to Waraqa bin Nawfal and he says, You are the Prophet. I wish I could be there when your people will oppose you. I would help you and I would aid you and I would support you. And I would stand by your side if that day would come. Now what happens at this particular point in juncture? Something very, very beautiful. And so Jibreel, the angel Gabriel, Jibreel comes to the Prophet ﷺ, takes him with him, strikes the earth, a spring comes forth from the earth, and he says, this is from the well of Zamzam. This is an offshoot, a branch of the well of Zamzam being provided for you here. So that, and then he shows him, Wudu. Jibreel Alaihissalam shows the Prophet Sallallahu Wudu. And then the Prophet Sallallahu makes Wudu. And then Jibreel stands up and shows him how to pray two rakahs. This is before the five times daily prayer. Just how to pray two rakahs. So that he can talk to Allah and pray when he needs it. إِذَا حَزَبَهُ أَمْرٌ فَزَعَ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ Whenever any situation came up, he would immediately go to his prayer. Guess what the Prophet Sallallahu does? With this new salah, this wudu, this purification and this prayer that he's just learned, he rushes back home to his beloved wife. The first believer, his strongest supporter, his rock. He goes home to her and he grabs her by the hand and he says, Come on, I have to share something with you. I have to show you something amazing. And he takes her there and they make wudu together. And then he stands up with her and he says, Now follow after me. And he shows her how to pray and they pray together. And so, now what happens? Khadija radiallahu ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu had money, had wealth. And they realized that many poor people in Mecca, slaves in Mecca, are accepting Islam. And they start spending their money. The Prophet sallallahu can't take out time anymore to go on business trips and go and make more money. He's got to preach, he's got to teach. He's got to spread the message far and wide. And Khadija every single morning wakes up and is standing there with him at the door, telling him, go out there and spread this message far and wide. And on top of that, on the other side, while he can't go out and do business anymore, there are constantly slaves who need freeing, who've become Muslim and are being tortured because they're Muslim. So they need to be freed. So they're spending their own money freeing these slaves, feeding the poor, looking after people, sending people off to Habasha, to East Africa, to escape persecution, to go and live there in freedom and in safety. They spend their money in sending these people off, making sure they're okay. Finally, the time comes where eventually a lot happens during this time. Over the next six, seven years, a lot happens. And they finally, the Meccans, the Quraysh, the opposition to the message of the Prophet ﷺ, they decide that the only way to really handle and curb this issue is to boycott Muhammad, his family and his followers and his supporters. Kick them out from Mecca and isolate them and boycott them. So Abu Talib rounds up the clan. All the believers, all the followers, all the supporters including the Prophet ﷺ, his beloved wife Khadija, and their children. And they go into the Shi'ab of Abi Talib. A place, some property, some land Abu Talib had outside of Mecca. And they are isolated there for three years. Nobody will do business with them. Nobody will trade with them. Nobody will lend them any money. Nobody will provide them any food. Nobody will deal with them in any way, shape or form. Nobody will show them any kind. And they spent three years like this. Days would go by where people wouldn't have food to eat and water to drink. Babies would cry because they were hungry and their mothers would cry because they hadn't eaten anything to be able to nurse their babies. 
Children died. Babies died. There were graves of babies and children. Many, many people died during this time. Dozens of graves were dug during this time. The cries and the screams of women crying over the passing of babies and children could be heard all the way into Mecca. People became sick, malnourished, very, very ill. Until finally, through again the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, miraculous means, the boycott was lifted. And everybody came back into Mecca. And it said that during this time, Khadija, who was a lot older now, she, came, she became very sick and very ill. And they came back from this boycott in the Shia of Abi Talib, and she passed away a few months later. And that harshness of those three years, not just the physical harshness, harshness but the emotional, difficulty, watching these people struggle, caring for them, loving them. She was like a mother to all of them. Her heart just couldn't bear it. And a couple of months later, she was bedridden for a few months. And the Prophet ﷺ was so distraught this entire time. Until finally one day she breathed her last and she passed away. There are narrations which talk about the fact that the Prophet ﷺ was so devastated. He's a single father. Two of his daughters are not married. Fatima was quite young. She's a young girl. She was maybe 8, 10, 12 years old. And he was so devastated at the loss of his beloved wife Khadija. He actually didn't come out of his home. Just sat at home with his daughter recovering. Mourning. Healing. For a few days, he was not seen outside. Uh, when Khadija passed away, uh, one of the Sahaba says, we did not see him smile for months. We did not see him smile for months. And it was such a, a big loss for the Prophet Muhammad. And when his family members came to see him, you could see the, 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 the streaks of tears on his face. Hugging his daughter sitting there, trying to console his daughter at the loss of her mother. And so yes, the Prophet ﷺ did eventually get remarried. A couple of years later. And yes, the Prophet ﷺ eventually left Mecca and migrated to Medina. And yes, eventually he established the most beautiful community this earth has ever seen. And yes, when eventually he had grandchildren and laughed again and smiled again and had a beautiful experience and happiness and joy in his life. But you know something very interesting? He never forgot Khadija. Never forgot Khadija. Never. Four years after she passed away. Four years after she passed away. It was the Battle of Badr. It's a longer story, but basically, his son-in-law was one of one of the prisoners of war. He had come in the battle on the op opposition side, and he was captured. So his daughter, eldest daughter Zainab, sends her necklace to secure the ransom of her husband. The Prophet ﷺ was unaware of Allah this situation. When the necklace is put before him. He sees that necklace and immediately knows where he's seen it before. This is Khadija's necklace. That she passed on to her daughter, her eldest daughter Zainab. And the second the Prophet sees that necklace, tears start streaming down his face. Immediately, on contact. And the people around him are so taken aback. By the immediate uh, you know, onslaught, just a rush of emotions that the Prophet is experiencing, some of them begin to apologize and ask, is everything okay? And the Prophet says, you guys did nothing. I just recognize this necklace. It belongs to my Khadija. She gave it to our daughter Zainab. And seeing this necklace reminds me of her. And of course, the Prophet ﷺ requested the companions, if you don't mind, we'll release my son-in-law 
and send this necklace back to my daughter because that's all she's got of her mother. One time the Prophet ﷺ is sitting at home and somebody brings a gift. And the Prophet ﷺ immediately tells one of the young Sahaba who used to like assist him. They would, you know, help the Prophet run his errands and things like that. One of his young assistants, he tells them, all right, I need you to take this gift to such and such woman's house. And some of the family members of the Prophet ﷺ are like, who's that? Such a nice gift, somebody sends it for you and you send it to, like, we're not sure, I mean, is there some, somebody we don't know about? Like just, are you related to somebody we're not aware of? They sincerely are asking. And he says, no, that's one of Khadija's friends. I still like to send her gifts to respect Khadija's memory, to honor her memory. When you would sacrifice an animal, like bring some meat into the house or you know, cook some nice, some nice food was cooked in the home of the Prophet he immediately would take some aside and say, go give this to Khadija's friends. Go take some food to them. One time the Prophet is sitting at home and he hears a knock. And it's a very distinct type of knock. So the Prophet ﷺ hears a very distinct door knock that he recognizes. Whatever it was. And he hears that, and that's the same way Khadija used to knock a door. Same way Khadija used to knock a door. And it was her sister Hala. They grew up together. You know, sisters that are close in age grow up together. You know, a lot of things they have in common, very, very similar. So, she used to knock the door the same way that her sister Khadija used to knock the door. And as soon as the Prophet ﷺ heard that knock, he jumped up and ran to the door saying, Allahumma hala, Allahumma hala. Allah, please let it be hala, let it be hala, let it be my sister-in-law hala. And he opens the door and it's hala, and he invites her in, sits her down, and they talk for hours about Khadija. Hours about Khadija. This is a decade after she passed away. Hours and hours. Remember that time she did this? Remember that time she did that? Remember how she used to say that? Remember how she used to do that? Remember how she used to do this? They would talk about Khadija for hours and hours and hours and hours. One of the later wives of the Prophet ﷺ, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, even remarked, she said, sometimes it seems like there's nobody else in this world besides Khadija. Like there's just nothing, nobody besides Khadija. It's all you talk about. Any little thing, yep, Khadija used to do that. You know what, Khadija used to do it just like that. That's how Khadija used to like to do it, all the time. One time some people asked the Prophet ﷺ, tell us a little bit about Khadija. And the Prophet ﷺ, in one narration, he says, رُزِقْتُ حُبَّهَا رُزِقْتُ حُبَّهَا I was given Rizq, Rizq, sustenance, a gift from God. He said, Ruziqtu, God sent me her love from the heavens. God gave me her love from the heavens. Her love was divine. Ruziqtu hubbaha. Wa kana li minha walad. She was the mother of my children. She was the love of my life and the mother of my children. That's who she was. In one narration, they asked her, tell us about Khadija, tell us about Khadija. Some young companions. And the Prophet ﷺ says, Innaha kanat wa kanat. It's like saying she was and she just, she just was. Where do you want me to start? Where do I begin? I can't even put it into words. I don't even know what to tell you. She was so amazing. I can't explain it to you. You had to see her, you had to know her, you had to experience it to realize how amazing and remarkable she was. There's a beautiful passage. Ibn Ishaq writes this. فَخَفَّفَ اللَّهُ بِذَلِكَ عَنْ رَسُولِهِ Allah lightened, Allah, God, lightened the load of the Prophet ﷺ through Khadija. She was the pillar that he could rest and support and lean on. He goes on to say, God lightened the load. 
eased the task of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam by means of Khadija. Whenever he heard anything that bothered him, when people rejected him, when they, you know, reprimanded him, when they cursed him and sweared at him, and it would actually hurt him, it would cause him pain. He would go back home to Khadija, and he would talk to Khadija. Allah would remove the grief, the sorrow, the concern, the pain from the Prophet ﷺ by means of Khadija reinforcing him. That was that was very very nice. Like I said, I liked um, this story from the beginning. It was just so so amazing. Look at these people coming together and just creating something out of this world. This is a story to fall in love with on its own. You fall in love with the story. You fall in love with the characters. I like how there was something that I noted in the in the video. Um, how. Muhammad started getting these vision or rather was it dreams and he took time to figure out what they meant I, th I feel like that's how we should be in life there's many times many of us dream certain things that have um, meanings but we just push it aside not everything is just a dream is not just supposed to be a dream sometimes dreams do mean something look into them pray about it and maybe you get an understanding of it better and you know what to do with it otherwise this was a lovely lovely story everything in this was just amazing it's a shame Khadija had to had had to die truly really, really sad at least she died knowing that she had given her heart to help other people look at the way this woman is portrayed such a pure pure heart everything about the coming together the marriage was pure if he needed something he would go to her and in return she would provide him with whatever she could that's how i just feel like that's how things should be but anyway a big shout out to the person that suggested this and don't forget to give this video a thumbs up share it with your friends and of course don't forget to subscribe and see you in my next reaction video Thank you.